Hello, welcome to another episode of 10 Minute Lance Fair. I'm Dave Woolley. Today I'm gonna to talk about boundary and I'm gonna talk very specifically about determining boundaries, uh, how, you, how you reason out your evidence and, and ultimately and, and what the standard of proof is. And that might be a term or actually that should be a term that everybody's familiar with. Let me back up for a second. I've been pacing the floors for three months now over the fact that uh, there was an expert case. I wasn't really involved with it. I was following it on the periphery. And I got an expert's report, expert, big air quotes, expert report. And, uh, you know, it was really nicely put together, uh, margins and formats and photos and, you know, thing numbered 30 pages or so. And so, you know, I being an expert in having served in many of these instances, I'm, I'm always interested in other people's work, uh, just if for no other reason to compare my own. So I'm reading through the report and the second paragraph says that this boundary is basically undeterminable or there's, there's large margins of error in there and that the boundary couldn't be determined beyond a reasonable doubt. My head exploded. My eyes did the Looney Tunes beyond a reasonable doubt on the boundary. I, I, I quite literally threw the report, uh, which I'm not really prone to throwing things like that, but I was just like, oh my God, we are in an expert situation and they are using the standard of proof of beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and it still bothers me to this day. It, it makes me mad as hell because an expert is supposed presumably an expert on some level, and they're supposed to lend to clarification to the court, meaning they come in and they explain technical matters to the court or to the jury or to a, a combination of them just to bring clarity to it. An expert's not an advocate. They're there to uh, uh, reason out uh, technical information that lay people wouldn't necessarily know or officers of the court wouldn't really know. So when I read Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, I'll, let me explain to you why that kills me to this day. I'm gagging. So there's three standards of proof as it applies to, to uh, civil and criminal proceedings. And the, the, the strictest standard of proof that we're all familiar with is beyond a reasonable doubt. And this is a criminal standard. And that's why it was killing me when you have civil litigation and a surveyor uses a criminal standard. And so it's beyond a reasonable doubt is the criminal standard. Then in the civil side, you have two standards of proof. You have a preponderance of evidence and you have clear and convincing. And I'm gonna kind of talk to you a little bit about them uh, the different style. Uh, for a boundary surveyor, your standard is preponderance of evidence. And so when you're evaluating evidence, it's 51% to 49 in a very close call. And that's where surveyors generally are gonna disagree. Somebody else might have 51, 49 the other way. And so there's a disagreement. But I've always held that surveyors with the uh, same amount of experience and background will come up with the same answer almost all the time because we really aren't in situations where it's 5149. When I see surveyors disagree, it's because one of them didn't either, one of them has access to evidence that the other one didn't consider is usually the case. And he's usually on the research side or the found monument side. Because boundary surveying in and of itself isn't that difficult. Um, it's just a matter of collecting evidence. And if you have the same evidence, it's usually not 5149. And, and surveyors will agree on the evidence unless they're just disagreeable or inexperienced. So preponderance of evidence. So uh, an example is, is, in short, boundaries are established by monuments. Monuments hold over maps. Uh, deeds are read like contracts. Conflicting elements in a deed, there's a hierarchy. And again, it goes back to monuments and areas on the last side of that. And basically, the, the framework of boundary determination is, sits right there. Well, when you're evaluating the evidence, let's say that I have a, you know, a 1955 foundation that I believe is, is uh, paramount and it's a monument to the original boundary and another surveyor finds an old uh, iron pipe with no tag that doesn't match up to that foundation. And so that surveyor believes that 
the pipe is an original and I'm saying it's not. And so there's, there's a, an example of conflicting, uh, weighing it out. And uh, the other surveyor is 51% with the pipe and I'm 51% with the foundation and we have a disagreement. Now it comes to quantifying the disagreement. Are we arguing over hundreds or inches or does it make feet? And, and that's how boundaries get determined. So if you don't understand your standard of proof, you can't make a determination on your boundary because you're using the wrong tool set, the wrong frame of reference to make a determination. So when I see a surveyor in the second paragraph say that they can't determine the boundary beyond a reasonable doubt, nothing you say in the other 29 pages of that report mean anything. It's all garbage. And it's particularly embarrassing when uh, an officer of the court uh, or the court itself, uh, when they, when they read this and they're, they're, they know criminal standards and they say beyond a reasonable doubt, who is this clown? You know, uh, boom, I, I would think that they'd be disqualified immediately because you wouldn't confuse that if you understood it. So I'm going on a little bit because I'm incensed that this happened. And if you're an expert or you want uh, aspire to be an expert, it's absolutely paramount that you understand the standards of proof. So let's look at the screen here. And you can read better than, faster than I can read to you. So I'll, I'll for, spare you. So standards of proof, civil trials. You can go ahead and look at this. And this is a, this is a paper that I, I actually uh, put together back in uh, 2017. Uh, it, it's uh, 12 pages on the various standards of proof and, and things that you deal with. If, if you look here, you'll see that you can go up. I never did publish it but it, it talks about uh, California standards, substantial rights, any grounds, harmless errors, de novo, uh, clearly erroneous standard, blah, blah, blah. Standard evidence, substantial evidence standard. But the really good stuff is, as it pertains to this particular talk, is right here. Preponderance of evidence. You'll notice here that it says civil cases. Uh, preponderance of evidence, and this is what we deal with, and they're gonna decide, and then you, you know that that's the, the, their, uh, and, and if you look here, there it is. And so I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, employment discrimination, RICO actions, civil fraud actions, oral partnerships, oral modifications of written contracts. And th those are examples that are commonly referred to. And I, I, I just took this out of a book here. So clear and convincing. Now this is a much higher standard, uh, clear and convincing is. And uh, I've had some situations uh, that I've been involved with where the officer of the court, the attorneys were arguing that the, the, ever, this, the proper standard, and, and this is, back it up one, uh, a lot of times, not a lot of times, often what they do is the attorneys have a, a couple of different things generically. They have to argue, they have to propose uh, an action or, and it has to fill the, uh, the, the elements. So the action might be adverse action. They'll argue that action, uh, adverse possession, I'm sorry. And then they, they have to, for adverse possession, you've paid the taxes, you've occupied it for 20 years, on and on and on. Those are the elements that go to it. And they'll also say that to the judge that the, the standard for this particular action or this particular uh, claim is this. And they, they'll lay out the standard for, for whatever it is they are. So the next standard is clear and convincing. And clear and convincing, here it is right here, Clear and convincing is a higher than preponderance of evidence standard, yet not as high as the criminal beyond a reasonable doubt. Clear and convincing evidence is the amount of proof that produces in the mind of the trier of fact a firm belief or conviction as to the truth of allegations sought to be established. So what are some examples of that? Well, you'll notice here that uh, a lot of federal, uh, federal cases are referenced to the clear and convincing standard. You have uh, alien detention, deportation, uh, immigration uh, issues, uh, denaturalization, civil contempt, 
Uh, this is interesting. Civil contempt. A party moving to hold another party in contempt must demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence that the alleged contemporor violated the court's prior order. But in criminal contempt proceedings, the government burden is beyond a reasonable doubt. Termination of parental rights. You know, you, we, we would all could imagine how, how difficult that must be. Clear and convincing. Waiver of constitutional rights. Defamation of a public figure, civil commitment, uh, fraud on the court, patent infringement, related issues, forcible medication. Okay, as, as an American, uh, not knowing anything about the court system, you'd recognize that these things would have a very high standard, and that standard's clear and convincing. Uh, goes here. I, I got a lot in here, but the uh, now here we are beyond a reasonable doubt standard and beyond a reasonable doubt is required for conviction in all criminal proceedings. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you firmly convinced that the defendant is guilty. It is not required that the government prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense and is not based purely on speculation and criminal contempt, juvenile delinquency, so on and so forth. So, you know, going back through this paper, I should publish it. But if you're a boundary surveyor, you know that when you're evaluating your evidence, first thing you need to do is have all the evidence. Uh, another surveyor coughs up something you missed, game over. Uh, it doesn't really matter the significance of that evidence. If you missed it and you weren't able to evaluate it, then what good is your conclusion? The next thing is, is know that you're dealing with a preponderance of evidence, 5149, and know that you, if another surveyor has a survey and it looks reasonably sound, you shouldn't accept that expert engagement and t be tasked with impeaching that surveyor's good, reasonable analysis. Your job is, as an expert, is to say, you know, you have a pretty good survey here. It makes sense. You're going to pay me a heck of a lot of money to argue over an inch or a tenth or something like this, and frankly, I won't waste your money. If you want to talk about what that survey says in a technical aspect, I'd be glad to explain it to you. But you would not accept that engagement having known that the evidence was pretty clear and that it was reasonably determined. Uh, that's no role for an expert because you're not there to impeach people for the sake of impeaching them. You have to truly believe in this case. At least that's my philosophy. Now, I know surveyors that become advocates, and it, it's, in my experience, it's distasteful. Um, and, and to that end, like in my personal experience, I probably decline 80% of the opportunities to be an expert. And I put in quite a bit of time to make the determination that I'm not able to offer anything of significance towards that process. Uh, I only take cases that I really think as an expert I could contribute to the, to the technical aspects of that case uh, and explaining them as a standard of care. So, and I think that's true with any expert. If you find somebody that proclaims to be an expert, uh, look to see all right, just ask them. Of course, this isn't really for the surveyors, but uh, how many times they've testified. Because, you know, for example, I've been designated God knows how many times. Being designated doesn't mean anything other than you gave them your name, a rate sheet, and your, your CV. What really counts as an expert is how many times have you testified. Testified is in court, also depositions, and uh, declarations. And that, those are the, your, your testimony. So how many of those do you have? And that's how you can measure your expert is how many, how many times they've actually been through the process where the court has accepted their expert testimony. And I guess you could always ask them, do you know where this boundary is beyond a reasonable doubt? And if they answer affirmative, pass. You don't have an expert. In the meantime, I hope to wean myself off the glycerin. I hope my heart will finally settle down and I'll be able to get over that experience. So put away your clown shoes, pack away your mini bike, understand that if you're determining boundaries and evaluating evidence, your standard is preponderance of evidence. Beyond a reasonable doubt is a criminal standard. 
Thank you and have a nice day.